There are many dangers that come with professional and recreational diving. Along with these dangers, there are precautions that must be taken to ensure that the divers are safe. Sometimes, these precautions fail. It is then that these divers must make bold decisions and fight for their lives. This video presents three of these stories. Dewey Smith was a United States Navy medic and a professional saturation diver out of Panama City, Florida. In 2005, he graduated from Florida State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in underwater crime scene investigation. From there, he gained diving experience working as a commercial welder. He got his break in 2007 when he was hired by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association to work on Aquarius. Aquarius was a 43-foot-long underwater habitat bolted to the ocean floor at 63 feet below the surface. Aquarius is located approximately three and a half miles off the coast of Key Largo. This underwater habitat is the only underwater laboratory in the world and is rented out for training and research. To give an example of what this habitat was used for, shortly after Dewey was hired to work on the Aquarius, it was leased by NASA to be a representative space environment for astronaut training. Dewey was a dive researcher and maintenance technician for Aquarius. During the NASA astronaut training missions, Dewey worked as a saturation diver habitat technician. The crew was submerged and lived and worked underwater for 10 days in Aquarius. Dewey was known as an aquanaut, or a diver that remains underwater breathing at ambient pressure for long enough that the inert gases dissolve into the body tissue to equilibrium. In academia, this is known as an aquanaut. In commercial diving, it is known as saturation diving. In May 2009, Dewey was training Navy divers in saturation diving. Dewey was assisting Navy divers Bill Dodd and Corey Seymour in installing an underwater way station 300 feet from Aquarius on the ocean floor. The way station was to be a breathable stop for divers conducting future exploration and research of the Conch Reef. During the dive, the Navy divers were connected by an umbilical providing their air. Dewey was diving with a rebreather. A rebreather is a device that removes the diver's exhaled carbon dioxide when breathing, the diver uses only a portion of the oxygen in the gas mixture. Oxygen is added back to the inert gas and the remaining oxygen to provide a predetermined amount of oxygen under pressure to the diver. This allows the diver, in this case Dewey, to remain underwater longer. Diving with a rebreather is the second most dangerous activity per hour next to base jumping. During the dive, the Navy divers, Bill and Corey, were using an underwater jackhammer to install the way station. Dewey signaled the divers that he was going back to Aquarius, but would soon return. The Navy divers continued hammering. Bill Dodd and Corey Seymour continued working. After another five minutes, Corey noticed something on the ocean floor. Upon inspection, he found that Dewey was lying unconscious on his side with his mouthpiece out of his mouth. Bill and Corey rushed to his aid. Corey grabbed Dewey and carried him 200 feet before his umbilical became stuck behind him. He couldn't carry Dewey any further. Bill carried Dewey the rest of the way, where divers waiting in the Aquarius pulled Dewey into the submerged habitat and began CPR. Though all divers were trained in emergency response techniques, two physicians dove down to the Aquarius for support. The physicians took turns conducting CPR on Dewey, but they couldn't revive him. Dewey Dwayne Smith passed at 3.25 p.m. May 5, 2009. He was 36 years old. A subsequent investigation revealed what happened to Dewey. After Dewey signaled the Navy divers that he was returning to Aquarius, he turned and began swimming back. What he didn't know was that pressure waves from the jackhammer had turned off the electronics package on his rebreather. The electronics package is a control system for maintaining a constant oxygen delivered to the diver as well as monitoring safety. With the electronics package turned off by the hammer-induced pressure waves, the oxygen was not being regulated and any safety features were also not active. 
Dewey was running out of oxygen and didn't know it. As Dewey swam away from his only potential aid, in the dark waters, his heart rate increased and so did his oxygen intake. This rapidly reduced his available oxygen until it was gone. Dewey died from hypoxia, or lack of oxygen. Before he died, he would have noticed the effects, but may not have recognized the cause, as nearly all people who pass out due to hypoxia do not recognize the symptoms unless they have been trained to do so. Since Dewey's death, not only have rebreathers been modified, but new inventions have been created to warn divers of low oxygen and potential hypoxia, including a device known as the Dewey Monitor, which detects hypoxia in a diver independently of the rebreather electronics package. Kirsty Anna McCall was born in England on October 10, 1959 to famous folk singer Ewan McCall. She followed in her father's footsteps, becoming a famous recording artist with relatively successful singles, They Don't Know and You Caught Me, from 1979. She followed this up in 1981 with a UK top 20 hit named There's a Guy Works Down the Chip Shop Swears He's Elvis. She went on to do several covers in the 1980s and 90s that were met with minor acclaim, as well as collaborations and backup vocals for the likes of The Rolling Stones, Robert Plant, The Smiths, Simple Minds, Talking Heads, ABBA, and David Gilmour. All in all, a very successful career for a singer-songwriter. In her personal life, she married fellow artist Steve Lillywhite in 1984 and divorced 10 years later, having had two sons together, Jamie and Lewis. Kirsty fell in love with traveling while she was touring. It was like a sudden liberation of my brain. I had spent so long being unhappy in a very British way, and suddenly there was all this new stuff. Specifically, she loved traveling to South America and the Caribbean. She enjoyed taking her sons, Jamie and Lewis, on these trips to show them the world. So it was only appropriate that her sons were with her when she traveled to Havana, Cuba for a radio show in December of 2000. After recording the show, Kirsty took Lewis, age 13, and Jamie Amy, age 15, and her boyfriend at the time, James Knight, to Cozumel, Mexico for a little exploring. Cozumel is an island off the coast of Mexico in the Caribbean Sea. It is an extremely popular tourist destination for many reasons. It also attracts many divers to explore the many diverse coral reefs. Kirsty scheduled a dive for December 18th with her sons to explore Chonkanob Reef. The group dove with veteran dive master Ivan Diaz in an area of the National Marine Park of Cozumel with restricted access to motor vehicles. This was a scheduled tourist dive with a dive master overseeing. By all accounts, it was an extremely safe and exciting dive. During the dive, everything went perfectly as planned. When the dive time was up, the instructor signaled for the group to surface. Everyone did as told and headed up. When Kirsty surfaced, she saw a boat speeding directly toward her son, Jamie, and Jamie did not see the boat. In an instant, Kirsty did what any loving mother would do, and she grabbed her son and was able to just push him out of the way as she put herself between her son and the speeding boat. Jamie received minor head and rib injuries while his mother took the brunt of the boat and died instantly. The speeding boat was owned by Carlos Gonzalez Nova, founder of Commercial Mexicana, a multi-million dollar supermarket chain. Aboard the boat was Carlos's brother, the multi-million dollar president of the supermarket chain, Guillermo Gonzalez Nova, and his family. However, when questioned, an employee of Guillermo's, Jose Yam, stated that he was driving the boat. Furthermore, Guillermo stated that the boat was traveling no more than one knot. Eyewitnesses stated that Jose Yam was not driving the boat. The boat was operated by Guillermo, and the boat was definitely traveling more than one knot. However, the eyewitness accounts were ignored. Jose Yam was found guilty of culpable homicide and sentenced to two years, 10 months in prison. Under Mexican law, in lieu of prison, he paid a fine of approximately 90 US dollars. He was also forced to pay the family of Kirsty McCall based on Jose Yam's small salary. He paid the equivalent of 2,150 US dollars to the family. People who spoke to Jose Yam after the incident stated that he had been paid to take the fall for Guillermo. No one in the Nova family was ever held accountable for the death of Kirsty McCall.
At 3.50 p.m. on November 19, 2017, the Jersey City Police Department received a call from a distraught girlfriend of Robert Thomas stating that he was late for a party in Queens, New York. Robert had gone diving in the old Tilly Foster iron mine that morning and had not returned. Robert Thomas was a 48-year-old man that was a very experienced diver. He was a rebreather certified diver with plenty of dive experience. And Tilly Foster Mine was one of his favorite dive locations. He had been there many times. The Tilly Foster Mine was an old iron ore mine that opened in 1853. The mined ore was shipped to Scranton, Pennsylvania, where it was used to make steel rails for the Lackawanna Steel Company. From 1887 to 1889, it was made into an open pit mine and was the largest open pit mine operation in the world. The miners were Italian-Irish immigrants that were known by number rather than name. Thirteen of these miners died in 1895 when they were buried by a partial wall collapse. After the collapse, the mine was flooded by a nearby reservoir. Throughout the 20th century, the mine was basically used as a dump site by locals. This led to the mine floor being covered with old cars, farming equipment, appliances, and even potential human remains. The divers of Tilly Foster Mine are always on the lookout for a missing 17-year-old girl named Robin Murphy, whose body is believed to have been dumped in the mine. A police deputy showed up at the mine to find a distraught man and woman at the edge of the mine waiting for Robert to surface. Robert was well overdue to return based on the amount of air that he had taken with him. Dive teams were dispatched to the site from the New York State Police and from the Brewster Volunteer Fire Department. This was a very well organized technical dive with plenty of old mining equipment and the aforementioned items having been dumped into the mine over the years. This presented plenty of obstacles to the search and rescue mission. They dove over and over again, also deploying sophisticated sonar equipment to help locate the lost diver. In the afternoon of November 20th, Robert's body was found at 171 feet. This is what happened. The day before, Robert and his two diving companions, the man and the woman, traveled to Tilly Foster Mine. Robert, anxious to begin, started his dive at 12 noon without a dive buddy. He was a very experienced diver and was well aware and prepared for the dive. He dove this mine many times and was well aware of the inherent dangers. About one hour later, the other man began his dive while the woman stayed topside, waiting for the two divers to return. At approximately 3 p.m., the second diver returned to the surface without Robert, and Robert was overdue. They didn't know it, but below, Robert was trapped. At 171 feet below the surface, Robert had become entangled in wires and cables on the floor of the flooded mine. The more he struggled, the more he became entangled. There was no way out. By all accounts, Robert would have struggled to free himself to the end. At some point, as he was running out of air, he would have realized that he wasn't going to make it back to the surface and had to accept his fate. This is True Mysteries. Please like, leave comments, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.